Today we're going to be talking about chapter 8 from our book, which is solving problems controlling extraneous variables. And it might be helpful to start by defining what an extraneous variable is. And it is anything outside of our experiment that could confound our results. So for example, physical variables, aspects of the situation like the day of the week or the lighting or the experimental room. No one runs research on Friday or Saturday nights, with human participants, that is. Why not? Well, because the people who would show up for a study being run on a Saturday night would be different from people who would come during the week. So this is both an internal validity issue and an external validity issue. Internal validity meaning um, those are different groups of people, and external validity um, you can't generalize your results to the general population from who comes to uh, being in a, in a study on a Saturday night. Elimination removes extraneous variables by getting rid of them, eliminating them. So I can give you an example. I had a colleague who had sunlight coming into their lab, and so they would get different amounts of light uh, coming in during the day or during the night. Now the problem was they were doing perceptual research, so this affected participants' ability to do the task. So what they ended up doing was taping the windows over with aluminum foil and then putting black up, blackout curtains up over that, and that eliminated the problem, hence the term elimination. Constancy of conditions, uh, what that means is you keep all aspects of the treatment conditions identical, except for the independent variable. This is, I think, the best of the ways of dealing with uh, extraneous variables because it controls variables you haven't identified, okay? So things like the room, the time of the day, the day of the week, the gender of the experimenter, instructions that you give to them, etc. Um, all of those could uh, potentially be extraneous variables and you're able to hold them constant. Balancing uh, controls extraneous variables by, equ by distributing them equally across your treatment conditions. So if you're running research in two rooms, don't run the experimental group in one room and the control group in the other room. Because what you're doing is systematically linking changes in the independent variable with location. And that's a confound. So balancing would say run half of your experimental group in one room and half in the other room, or run half of your control group in one room and half in the other room. So you distribute um, the extraneous variable of location across your treatment conditions. So which order should you use? Well, elimination uh, may be first because uh, that gets rid of things. Um, that could be a problem, then constancy of conditions, then balancing. Um, this is okay. Constancy of conditions, though, I, I, to go back to that, I think it's the most important because we literally don't know what we don't know. And so it eliminates confounds, like I said, that we aren't aware of, that we haven't identified. What are social variables? Um, the relationships between participants and experimenters. So let's talk about our relationship and specifically demand characteristics and experimenter bias. Um, demand characteristics are cues within the experimental situation. Um, people will do things for science that they wouldn't uh, do normally, like participate in experiments. What students, or uh, excuse me, participants, because they don't have to be students, what they usually try to do is fulfill the expectations of the researcher. Okay, this is what we call a good participant. That's what they do. They figure out what the study's about and then do that. So demand characteristics can confound an experiment. Um, people fulfill what they think the experimental hypothesis is. Okay. Um, so how do we control for this threat um, to our internal validity? Well, we can do a single blind experiment. In a single blind experiment, people don't know if they're in the treatment condition, uh, if they're uh, in the experimental condition, or if they're in the control condition. Um, this contrasts with a double blind study where neither the participant or the researcher know what treatment condition the person's in. 
um, all drug research is run double blind. Um, and really, uh, it's much more common to run across a double blind study than a single blind study. It's not that much harder to run a double blind study. Uh, single blind studies, though, are able to control um, demand characteristics. Um, people feel privileged and important when they know that they're in the experimental condition of a drug trial. And that tends to lead to the placebo effect. Um, people get better. Uh, this isn't just all in their head because it affects your body too. Um, placebo effects, I can tell you this too, is, that's a very hot topic of, of research right now um, in the sciences. A cover story, a false plausible explanation for what's going on. Uh, here's another example. This is used in, in sleep research. Uh, people think they're in the lab for five days as a part of a dietary study. They stay there 24 hours a day. Um, but really they're part of a sleep study. And so you want to control demand characteristics by making participants think the study is about something different than what it's really about which is another word for deception. What's experimenter bias? Well, as experimenters, we want to see our experimental hypotheses fulfilled, okay? Uh, this leads to publications, which leads to promotion, grants, tenure, etc. All the things that make life worth living. Let me tell you, academia is a gravy train with biscuit wheels. But you don't succeed without publishing. Publish or perish, that's what we say. So what's the Rosenthal effect? Uh, experimenters treat people differently based on their expectations. Um, this is named for Robert uh, Rosenthal, and he found that it worked both in the lab with rats and in the classroom with teachers. So let's talk about the teachers. If teachers were told that a student would be an intellectual bloomer that year, based on their test scores, their standardized, standardized test scores, um, they found that the teachers were friendlier to those students, they called on them more, they gave them more and more difficult material, and, then, and also gave them more and better feedback. And so, um, you want to be the intellectual bloomer in the class. Um, of course, that those students do better because of that. Single blind versus double blind experiments. Again, if you're submitting drug testing to the FDA, it had better be double blind because they're certainly aware of um, experimenter bias. Uh, how might your personality affect experimental results? Well, um, we return again to the problem of demand characteristics and constancy of conditions. Treat everybody the same. Don't be warm and friendly with some people and a hostile and authoritarian with others unless that's what you're manipulating or what you're intending to manipulate. So how can you control personal var variables? Employing multiple experimenters and then running that as an independent variable. I can tell you I've never seen anyone actually do this. If your independent variable effect size is that small, or if it's so small that who's running the research affects um, your results, it's not going to be very significant, uh, both literally and figuratively. Um, you want your, your findings to be robust, which means it holds up across researchers, universities, ideally species. So how can we control personality variables? Again, constancy of conditions. Uh, controlling extraneous variables that you haven't even identified. I feel like I'm pushing that a lot. but So volunteers, uh, people who are volunteering to be, to be in research are different from people in the general population. This is an external validity issue. Um, in work doing research at universities, uh, it's usually college students who are, who are the volunteers, and that's a huge confound right there, because if you're in college, you tend to be smarter, better educated, more cooperative, etc., than people in the general population. What are context variables? Well, uh, extraneous variables produced by experimental procedures 
created by the research setting environment. Well, what happens uh, when you run research at university on college students, especially on psychology students? Well, people get to choose what experiments they want to participate in. So letting people choose the research they want to be a part of both impacts the internal validity of the research, which means the uh, being able to make causal statements because people are choosing what they want to be a part of, and running college students in your research and psychology students at that um, is again an external validity issue because you can you generalize your results um, from those psychology undergraduates to the general population. Here's a temptation, running your friends in your experiments. It's hard to get people to participate in your study, so why not just put your friends in? Well, probably because they'll want to be in the experimental group, which results in a non-random, which is a non-random assignment of people to conditions, which affects our internal validity. It's convenient, and I understand it. It happens all the time in senior research projects, but it's an issue. Um, Folklore, uh, this idea that people who sign up late in the later in the semester are, are different from people who sign up earlier in the semester. Um, look, run all your research online if you can. Um, then you don't run into this, really. Um, Rosenthal didn't have a problem with this because he did his research in the 60s and 70s when I don't believe there was an internet that was invented later by Al Gore, or at least that's what he used to say, or he got credited with saying. We'll put it that way. Well, that wraps up Chapter 8, and thanks for listening.